Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, Audiobook Part 19 The Identity of Interests Between the Soviet Union and All Mankind September 28, 1939 With the approach of the 22nd anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, the Sino-Soviet Cultural Association has asked me for an article On the basis of my own observations, I should like to elucidate a few problems concerning the Soviet Union and China, for they are being discussed by the people in China today, and apparently no definite conclusions have yet been reached. It may be of some help if I take this opportunity to set forth my views for the consideration of those who are concerned about the war in Europe and about Sino-Soviet relations. Some people say that the Soviet Union does not want the world to remain at peace because the outbreak of a world war is to its advantage and that the present war was precipitated by the Soviet Union's conclusion of a non-aggression treaty with Germany instead of a treaty of mutual assistance with Britain and France. I consider this view incorrect. The foreign policy of the Soviet Union over a very long period of time has consistently been one of peace a policy based on the close links between its own interests and those of the overwhelming majority of mankind. For its own socialist construction, the Soviet Union has always needed peace, has always needed to strengthen its peaceful relations with other countries and prevent an anti-Soviet war. For the sake of peace on a world scale, it has also needed to check the aggression of the fascist countries, curb the warmongering of the so-called democratic countries, and delay the outbreak of an imperialist world war for as long as possible. The Soviet Union has long devoted great energy to the cause of world peace. For instance, it has joined the League of Nations, signed treaties of mutual assistance with France and Czechoslovakia, and tried hard to conclude security pacts with Britain and all other countries that might be willing to have peace. Footnote 1. The League of Nations was an organization formed by Britain, France, Japan, and other imperialist powers after World War I for the redivision of the world through bargaining and temporary adjustments of conflicting interests. In 1931, the Japanese imperialists occupied China's northeast, and in 1933, Japan withdrew from the League of Nations in order to be able to extend her aggression more freely. In the same year, the German fascists came to power, and later they too withdrew from the League of Nations to facilitate their preparations for a war of aggression. It was in 1934, when the threat of a fascist war of aggression was growing, that the Soviet Union joined the League of Nations. In this way, the possibility arose of this imperialist organization for the redivision of the world being turned into one that might serve the cause of world peace. Italy withdrew from the League of Nations after her invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. End of footnote 1. Footnote 2. The Treaty of Mutual Assistance between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and France and the Treaty of Mutual Assistance between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the Czechoslovak Republic, were concluded in 1935. End of footnote 2. Returning to the main text. After Germany and Italy jointly invaded Spain and when Britain, the United States, and France adopted a policy of nominal non-intervention, but of actual connivance at their aggression, the Soviet Union opposed the non-intervention policy and gave the Spanish Republican forces active help in their resistance to Germany and Italy. After Japan invaded China, and when the same three powers adopted the same kind of non-intervention policy, the Soviet Union not only concluded a non-aggression treaty with China, but gave China active help in her resistance. When Britain and France connived at Hitler's aggression and sacrificed Austria and Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union spared no effort in exposing the sinister aims behind the Munich policy and made proposals to Britain and France for checking further aggression 
when Poland became the burning question in the spring and summer of this year, and it was touch and go whether World War would break out, the Soviet Union negotiated with Britain and France for over four months, despite Chamberlain's and Dodlier's complete lack of sincerity in an endeavor to conclude a treaty of mutual assistance to prevent the outbreak of war. But all these efforts were blocked by the imperialist policy of the British and French governments, a policy of conniving at, instigating, and spreading war, so that eventually the cause of world peace was thwarted, and the imperialist world war broke out. The governments of Britain, the United States, and France had no genuine desire to prevent this war. On the contrary, they helped to bring it about. Their refusal to come to terms with the Soviet Union and conclude a really effective treaty of mutual assistance based on equality and reciprocity proved that they wanted not peace but war. Everybody knows that in the contemporary world, rejection of the Soviet Union means rejection of peace. Even Lloyd George, that typical representative of the British bourgeoisie, knows this. Footnote 3. The British bourgeois politician Lloyd George, who had been Prime Minister during World War I, declared in Parliament in November 1938 when Britain, France, Germany, and Italy were going to negotiate that peace could not be won by rejecting Soviet participation in the negotiations. End of footnote 3. It was in these circumstances, and when Germany agreed to stop her anti-Soviet activities, abandon the agreement against the Communist International, and recognize the inviolability of the Soviet frontiers, that the Soviet-German non-aggression treaty was concluded. The plan of Britain, the United States, and France was to egg Germany on to attack the Soviet Union, so that they themselves, sitting on top of the mountain to watch the Tigers fight, could come down and take over after the Soviet Union and Germany had worn each other out. The Soviet-German non-aggression treaty smashed this plot. In overlooking this plot and the schemes of the Anglo-French imperialists who connived at and instigated war and precipitated a world war, some of our fellow countrymen have actually been taken in by the sugary propaganda of these schemers. These crafty politicians were not the least bit interested in checking aggression against Spain, against China, or against Austria and Czechoslovakia. On the contrary, they connived at aggression and instigated war, playing the proverbial role of the fishermen who set the snipe and claim at each other and then took advantage of both. They euphemistically described their actions as non-intervention, but what they actually did was to sit on top of the mountain to watch the tigers fight. Quite a number of people throughout the world have been fooled by the honeyed words of Chamberlain and his partners, failing to see the murderous intent behind their smiles, or to understand that the Soviet-German non-aggression treaty was concluded only after Chamberlain and Daldier had made up their minds to reject the Soviet Union and bring about the imperialist war. It is time for these people to wake up. The fact that the Soviet Union worked hard to preserve world peace to the very last minute proves that the interests of the Soviet Union are identical with those of the overwhelming majority of mankind. This is the first question I wanted to talk about. Some people say that now that the Second Imperialist World War has broken out, the Soviet Union will probably take sides. In other words, the Soviet Red Army seems to be on the point of joining the German Imperialist Front. I consider this view incorrect. On whichever side, the Anglo-French or the German, the war that has just broken out is an unjust, predatory, and imperialist war. The communist parties and the people of all countries should rise up against it and expose the imperialist character of both belligerents, for this imperialist war brings only harm and no benefit, whatever, to the people of the world, and they should expose the criminal acts of the social democratic parties in supporting the imperialist war and betraying the interests of the proletariat. The Soviet Union is a socialist country, a country in which the Communist Party is in power, and it necessarily maintains a clear-cut, two-fold attitude towards wars. 1. It firmly refuses to take part in any unjust, predatory, and imperialist war, and maintains strict neutrality towards the belligerents. Hence, the Soviet Red Army will never disregard principles and join either of the imperialist war fronts. 2. It actively supports just and non-predatory wars of liberation. For instance, it helped the Chinese people in their war of the Northern Expedition 13 years ago, and the Spanish people in their war against Germany and Italy up to this last year. 
it has been helping the Chinese people in their war of resistance against Japan for the last two years, and the Mongolian people in resisting Japan for the last few months, and it will certainly give help to any war for the liberation of the masses or of a nation which may break out in other countries in the future, and will certainly give help to any wars that contribute to the defense of peace. The history of the Soviet Union in the last 22 years has already proved this, and history will prove it again in the future. Some people regard the Soviet Union's trade with Germany, which is based on the Soviet-German commercial agreement, as an act of participation in the war on the German side. This view, too, is wrong, for it confuses trade with participation in war. Trade must not be confused with participation in war or with rendering assistance. For example, the Soviet Union traded with Germany and Italy during the Spanish War, yet nobody in the world said that the Soviet Union was helping Germany and Italy in their aggression against Spain. On the contrary, people said that it was helping Spain in resisting this aggression. The reason being that the Soviet Union actually did give help to Spain. Again, during the present Sino-Japanese War, the Soviet Union is trading with Japan, but nobody in the world is saying that the Soviet Union is helping Japan in its aggression against China. On the contrary, people say that it is helping China to resist this aggression, the reason being that it is actually helping China. At present, both sides in the World War have trading relations with the Soviet Union, but this cannot be regarded as assistance to either, still less as taking part in the war. Only if the nature of the war changes, if the war in one or more countries undergoes certain necessary changes and becomes advantageous to the Soviet Union and the peoples of the world, will it be possible for the Soviet Union to help or participate. Otherwise, it will not. As for the fact that the Soviet Union is obliged to trade to a greater or lesser extent or on more or less preferential terms with one or another of the belligerents according to how friendly or hostile it happens to be, that depends not on the Soviet Union, but on the attitude of the belligerents. But even if one or several countries adopt an anti-Soviet attitude, the Soviet Union will not break off trade relations with them, so long as they, like Germany before August 23rd, are willing to maintain diplomatic relations and conclude trade treaties with it and do not declare war on it. It should be clearly understood that such commercial relations do not mean assistance, much less participation in war. This is the second question I wanted to talk about. Many people in China are bewildered by the fact that Soviet troops have entered Poland. Footnote 4. On September 1, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland and occupied most of her territory. On the 17th, the reactionary Polish government fled abroad. On the same day, the Soviet Union dispatched its troops to eastern Poland in order to recover its own lost territories, emancipate the oppressed Ukrainian and Belarusian peoples, and check the eastward drive of the German fascist troops. End of footnote 4. The Polish question should be viewed from various angles from that of Germany, of Britain, and France, of the Polish government, of the Polish people, and of the Soviet Union. Germany started the war in order to plunder the Polish people and smash one flank of the Anglo-French imperialist front. By its nature, Germany's war is imperialist and should be opposed, not approved. As for Britain and France, they have regarded Poland as an object of plunder for their finance capital, exploited her to thwart the German imperialist attempt at a world redivision of the spoils, and made her a flank of their own imperialist front. Thus, their war is an imperialist war, their so-called aid to Poland being merely for the purpose of contending with Germany for the domination of Poland, and this war, too, should be opposed, not approved. As for the Polish government, it was a fascist, reactionary government of the Polish landlords and bourgeoisie, which ruthlessly exploited the workers and peasants and oppressed the Polish Democrats. Moreover, it was a government of greater Poland chauvinists, which ruthlessly oppressed the non-Polish minority nationalities, the Ukrainians, Belarusians, Jews, Germans, Lithuanians, and others, who number more than 10 million. It was itself an imperialist government, 
In the war, this reactionary Polish government willingly drove the Polish people to serve as cannon fodder for British and French finance capital, and it willingly served as a sector of the reactionary front of international finance capital. For 20 years, the Polish government consistently opposed the Soviet Union, and during the talks between Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, it obstinately rejected the Soviet offer to help it with troops. Moreover, it was an utterly incompetent government. Its huge army of over 1,500,000 collapsed at the first blow, and it brought the country to ruin in just two weeks, leaving the Polish people under the heel of German imperialism. Such were the towering crimes of the Polish government, and it would be wrong for us to waste any sympathy on it. As for the Polish people, they are victims. They should rise up against the oppression of the German fascist and against their own reactionary landlord and bourgeois classes, and establish an independent, free, and democratic Polish state. Without the slightest doubt, our sympathy must go out to the Polish people. As for the Soviet Union... Its actions have been perfectly just. It was confronted by two problems. The first problem was whether to let the whole of Poland fall under the rule of German imperialism or to help the minority nationalities of eastern Poland win their liberation. It chose the second course. A vast stretch of territory inhabited by Belarusians and Ukrainians had been snatched from the newborn Soviet state by the German imperialists as far back as 1918, when the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed, and it was later arbitrarily put under the rule of the reactionary Polish government by the Treaty of Versailles. What the Soviet Union has now done is merely to recover its lost territory, liberate the oppressed Belarusians and Ukrainians, and save them from German oppression. The news dispatches of the last few days show how warmly these minority nationalities are welcoming the Red Army with food and drink as their liberator, while not a single report of this kind has come in from western Poland, which has been occupied by German troops, or from the places in western Germany, which have been occupied by French troops. This shows clearly that the Soviet Union's war is a just and non-predatory war of liberation, a war helping to liberate weak and small nations and free the people. On the other hand, the war being waged by Germany and by Britain and France is an unjust, predatory, and imperialist war for the oppression of other nations and peoples. The second problem confronting the Soviet Union was Chamberlain's endeavor to continue his old anti-Soviet policy. His policy was, first, to impose a large-scale blockade on Germany and bring pressure on her from the West. Second, to try to form an alliance with the United States and to buy over Italy, Japan, and the countries of Northern Europe so as to isolate Germany. And third, to bribe Germany with the offer of Poland and even of Hungary and Romania. In short, Chamberlain resorted to all kinds of intimidation and bribery to get Germany to renounce the Soviet-German non-aggression treaty and turn her guns on the Soviet Union. This intrigue has been going on for some time and will continue. The powerful Soviet army's entry into eastern Poland with the aim of recovering the Soviet Union's own territory and liberating the weak and small nationalities there was at the same time a practical move to prevent the forces of German aggression from expanding eastward and to frustrate Chamberlain's intrigue. Judging by the news reports of the last few days, this Soviet policy has been most successful. It is a concrete manifestation of the identity of the interests of the Soviet Union with those of the overwhelming majority of mankind, including those of the oppressed people, under reactionary Polish rule. This is the third question I wanted to talk about. The whole situation since the conclusion of the Soviet-German non-aggression treaty constitutes a great blow to Japan and a great help to China. It strengthens the position of those resisting Japan and weakens the capitulators. The Chinese people have rightly welcomed this treaty. However, since the signing of the no Mon han Truce Agreement, British and U.S. news agencies have been busy spreading the story that a Soviet-Japanese non-aggression treaty is about to be signed, and this has caused some concern among some Chinese people who think that the Soviet Union may no longer help China. Footnote 5 The no Mon han Truce Agreement was concluded in Moscow in September 1939. In May 1939, 
the Japanese and the puppet Manchu Kuo troops had jointly attacked the troops of the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of Mongolia at No Mon Han, on the border between Mongolia and Manchu Kuo, and were completely defeated by the Soviet and Mongolian forces in a heroic war of self-defense. The Japanese then sued for peace. The truce agreement provided for an immediate ceasefire and the formation of a commission of four, with two representatives from each side, to demarcate the frontier between the Mongolian People's Republic and the puppet state of Manchu Kuo, at places where the conflict had taken place. End of footnote 5 I believe they are wrong. The nature of the No Man Han Truce Agreement is the same as that of the previous Chong Ku Fung Truce Agreement. Footnote 6 The Chong Ku Fung Truce Agreement was concluded in Moscow on August 11, 1938. At the end of July and the beginning of August 1938, the Japanese had committed acts of provocation against the Soviet troops in the Chung Ku Fung district on the border between China-Korea and the Soviet Union and had been vigorously repulsed. The Japanese sued for peace. The truce agreement provided for an immediate ceasefire and the formation of a commission of four with two representatives from the Soviet side and two from the Japanese Manchu Kuo side to investigate the boundary lines and make a final settlement. End of footnote 6. That is to say, the Japanese militarists, being compelled to admit defeat, have had to recognize the inviolability of the Soviet and Mongolian frontiers. These truce agreements will enable the Soviet Union to increase rather than decrease its aid to China. As for the talk about a Japanese-Soviet non-aggression treaty... The Soviet Union has been proposing it for many years, but Japan has invariably rejected it. Now, there is a section of the Japanese ruling class that wants such a treaty with the Soviet Union, but whether the Soviet Union will be willing depends on the basic principle of whether the treaty will accord with the interests of the Soviet Union and of the overwhelming majority of mankind. Specifically, it depends on whether the treaty will conflict with the interests of China's war of national liberation. Judging from Stalin's report to the 18th Congress on the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on March 10th this year, and Molotov's speech at the Supreme Soviet of the USSR on May 30th, I think the Soviet Union will not alter this basic principle. Even if such a treaty were to be concluded, the Soviet Union would certainly not agree to anything that would restrict its freedom of action in helping China. The interests of the Soviet Union will always conform and never conflict with the interests of China's national liberation. I hold this as absolutely beyond doubt. People who are prejudiced against the Soviet Union are capitalizing on the No Mon Han Truce Agreement and on the talk about a Japanese-Soviet non-aggression treaty in order to make trouble and stir up ill feeling between the two great nations of China and the Soviet Union. This is what the British, U.S., and French intriguers and the Chinese capitulators are doing. It is highly dangerous, and we must thoroughly expose their dirty tricks. It is obvious that China's foreign policy must be one of resistance to Japanese aggression. This policy means primarily relying on our own efforts, while not ignoring any possibility of securing help from abroad. Now that the imperialist world war has broken out, Foreign help is coming chiefly from three sources. 1. The Socialist Soviet Union. 2. The people of the capitalist countries. And 3. The oppressed nations in the colonies and semi-colonies. These are our only reliable sources of help. Anything else that might be called foreign help, even if it might become available, can only be regarded as supplementary and temporary. Of course, China should try to obtain such supplementary and temporary foreign help, but must never depend too much on it or consider it reliable. China should maintain strict neutrality towards the belligerents in the imperialist war and not join either side. To maintain that China should join the Anglo-French imperialist war front is a capitulator's view, which is harmful to the war of resistance as well as to the independence and liberation of the Chinese nation, 
and it should be flatly rejected. This is the fourth question I wanted to talk about. These four questions are being widely discussed by our fellow countrymen. It is a very good thing that they are giving attention to the study of international problems, to the relations between the imperialist world war and China's war of resistance, and between the Soviet Union and China, because their aim is victory over Japanese aggression. Here, I have given some of my basic views on these questions, and I hope that readers will not spare their comments. End of Identity of Interests Between USSR and Mankind Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, Audiobook Part 20 Introducing the Communist, October 4th, 1939. The Central Committee has long planned to publish an internal party journal, and now at last the plan has materialized. Such a journal is necessary for building up a Bolshevized Chinese Communist Party, a party which is national in scale and has a broad mass character, a party which is fully consolidated ideologically, politically, and organizationally. This necessity is all the more obvious in the present situation, which has special features. On the one hand, the danger of capitulation, of a split, and of retrogression within the anti-Japanese National United Front is increasing daily, while on the other, our party has stepped out of its narrow confines and become a major national party. The duty of the party is to mobilize the masses to overcome the dangers of capitulation, a split, and retrogression, and prepare against all possible eventualities, so that in case they occur, the party and the revolution will not suffer unexpected losses. An internal party journal is indeed most necessary at a time like this. This internal party journal is called the Communist. What is its purpose? What will it deal with? In what way will it differ from other party publications? Its purpose is to help build a Bolshevized Chinese Communist Party, which is national in scale, has a broad mass character, and is fully consolidated ideologically, politically, and organizationally. The building of such a party is imperative for the victory of the Chinese Revolution, and on the whole, the subjective and objective conditions for it are present. Indeed, this great undertaking is now in progress. A special party periodical is needed to help achieve this great task, which is beyond the capability of an ordinary party publication, and this is why the Communist is now being published. To a certain extent, our party is already national in scale, and has a broad mass character, and it is already a Bolshevized party, consolidated ideologically, politically, and organizationally, so far as its core of leadership, a part of its membership and its general line, and revolutionary work are concerned. That being so, why set a new task? The reason is that we now have many new branches, which have a great many new members, but which cannot yet be considered as having a broad mass character, as being ideologically, politically, and organizationally consolidated, or as being Bolshevized. At the same time, there is the problem of raising the political level of the older party members and of making further progress in Bolshevizing the older branches and consolidating them ideologically, politically, and organizationally. The circumstances in which the party now finds itself and the responsibilities it is shouldering are quite unlike those in the Revolutionary Civil War period. The circumstances are much more complex and the responsibilities much heavier. This is the period of the National United Front, and we have formed a united front with the bourgeoisie. This is the period of the War of Resistance against Japan, and the armed forces of our party are at the front, fighting a ruthless war against the enemy in coordination with the friendly armies. This is the period when our party has become a major national party and is therefore no longer what it was before. If we take all these factors together, we shall understand how glorious and momentous is the task we have set ourselves, the task of building up a Bolshevized Chinese Communist Party, a party which is national in scale and has a broad mass character, a party fully consolidated ideologically, politically, and organizationally. It is this kind of party that we now want to build, but how shall we go about it? We cannot answer this question without going into the history of our party and of its 18 years of struggle. 
It is fully 18 years since our first National Congress in 1921. In these 18 years, our party has gone through many great struggles, and the members of the party, its cadres and organizations, have all tempered themselves in these great struggles. They have had the experience both of splendid victories and grave defeats in the revolution. The party established a national united front with the bourgeoisie, and with the breakup of this united front, engaged in a bitter armed struggle with the big bourgeoisie and its allies. During the last three years, it has again entered into a period of a national united front with the bourgeoisie. It is through this kind of complex relationship with the Chinese bourgeoisie that the Chinese Revolution and the Communist Party of China have progressed in their development. This is a special historical feature, a feature peculiar to the revolution in colonial and semi-colonial countries and not to be found in the revolutionary history of any capitalist country. Moreover, since China is a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country, since her political, economic, and cultural development is uneven, since her economy is predominantly semi-feudal, and since her territory is vast, it follows that the character of the Chinese Revolution in its present stage is bourgeois democratic, that its principal targets are imperialism and feudalism, and that its basic motive forces are the proletariat, the peasantry, and the urban petty bourgeoisie, with the national bourgeoisie taking part at certain times and to a certain extent. It also follows that the principal form of struggle in the Chinese Revolution is armed struggle. Indeed, the history of our party may be called a history of armed struggle. Comrade Stalin has said, in China, the armed revolution is fighting the armed counter-revolution. That is one of the specific features and one of the advantages of the Chinese revolution. Footnote 1. J. V. Stalin, The Prospects of the Revolution in China. Works, English Edition, Foreign Languages Publishing House, Moscow, 1954, Volume 8, page 379. End of footnote 1. This is perfectly true. The specific feature peculiar to semi-colonial China is not present, or is not present in the same way, in the history of the revolutions led by communist parties in the capitalist countries. Thus, there are two basic specific features in the Chinese bourgeois democratic revolution. 1. The proletariat either establishes a revolutionary national united front with the bourgeoisie, or is forced to break it up, and two, armed struggle is the principal form of the revolution. Here we do not describe the party's relations with the peasantry and the urban petty bourgeoisie as a specific feature, first, because these relations are in principle, the same as those which confront communist parties all over the world, and secondly, because armed struggle in China is, in essence, peasant war, and the party's relations with the peasantry and its close relations with the peasant war are one and the same thing. It is because of these two basic specific features, in fact precisely because of them, that the building up and bolshevization of our party are proceeding in special circumstances. The party's failures or successes, its retreats or advances, its contraction or expansion, its development and consolidation are inevitably linked up with its relations with the bourgeoisie and with armed struggle. When the party takes a correct political line on the question of forming a united front with the bourgeoisie or of breaking it up when forced to do so, our party moves a step forward in its development, consolidation, and bolshevization. But when it takes an incorrect line on its relations with the bourgeoisie, then our party moves a step backwards. Similarly, when our party handles the question of revolutionary armed struggle correctly, it moves a step forward in its development, consolidation, and bolshevization. But when it handles the question incorrectly, it moves a step backward. Thus, for 18 years, the building and bolshevization of the party have been closely linked with its political line, with the correct or incorrect handling of the questions of the United Front and armed struggle. This conclusion is clearly confirmed by the 18 years of our party's history, or conversely, the more bolshevized the party, the more correctly can it decide upon its political line and handle the questions of the united front and armed struggle. This conclusion, too, is clearly confirmed by the 18 years of our party's history.
Therefore, the United Front, armed struggle, and party building are the three fundamental questions for our party in the Chinese Revolution. Having a correct grasp of these three questions and their interrelations is tantamount to giving correct leadership to the whole Chinese Revolution. We are now able to draw correct conclusions concerning these three questions by virtue of our abundant experience in the 18 years of our party's history, our rich and profound experience of failures and successes, retreats and advances, contraction and expansion. This means that we are now able to handle the questions of the united front of armed struggle and of party building in a correct way. It also means that our 18 years of experience have taught us that the United Front, armed struggle, and party building are the Chinese Communist Party's three magic weapons, its three principal magic weapons, for defeating the enemy in the Chinese Revolution. This is a great achievement of the Chinese Communist Party and of the Chinese Revolution. Here, let us briefly discuss each of the three magic weapons, each of the three questions. In the last 18 years, the United Front of the Chinese proletariat with the bourgeoisie and other classes has developed under three different sets of circumstances or through three different stages. The First Great Revolution, from 1924 to 1927. The War of Agrarian Revolution, from 1927 to 1937. And the present War of Resistance Against Japan. The history of the three stages has confirmed the following laws. 1. The Chinese national bourgeoisie will take part in the struggle against imperialism and the feudal warlords at certain times and to a certain extent, because foreign oppression is the greatest oppression to which China is subjected. Therefore, at such times, the proletariat should form a united front with the national bourgeoisie and maintain it as far as possible. 2. In other historical circumstances, the Chinese national bourgeoisie will vacillate and defect because of its economic and political flabbiness. Therefore, the composition of China's revolutionary united front will not remain constant at all times, but is liable to change. At one time, the national bourgeoisie may take part in it. At another, it may not. 3. The Chinese big bourgeoisie, which is comprador in character, is a class which directly serves imperialism and is fostered by it. Hence, the comprador Chinese big bourgeoisie has always been a target of the revolution. However, different groups within this big bourgeoisie are backed by different imperialist powers, so that when contradictions among these powers become sharper and when the edge of the revolution is mainly directed against a particular power, the big bourgeois groups dependent upon the other powers may join the struggle against that particular imperialist power to a certain extent and for a certain time. At such times, in order to weaken the enemy and add to its own reserves, the Chinese proletariat may form a united front with these groups and should maintain it as far as possible, provided it is advantageous to the revolution. 4. The comprador big bourgeoisie continues to be most reactionary even when it joins the united front alongside the proletariat in struggling against the common enemy. It stubbornly opposes any ideological, political, and organizational development of the proletariat and the proletarian party, tries to impose restrictions on them, and employs disruptive tactics such as deception, blandishments, corrosion, and savage attacks against them. Moreover, it does all this to prepare for capitulating to the enemy and splitting the united front. 5. The peasantry is the firm ally of the proletariat. 6. The urban petty bourgeoisie is a reliable ally. The validity of these laws was confirmed during the First Great Revolution and the Agrarian Revolution, and it is being confirmed again in the present War of Resistance. Therefore, in forming a united front with the bourgeoisie, and especially with the big bourgeoisie, the party of the proletariat must carry on a stern and resolute struggle on two fronts. On the one hand, it is necessary to combat the error of neglecting the possibility that the bourgeoisie may join in the revolutionary struggle at certain times, and, to a certain extent, it is an error of left closed doorism to regard the bourgeoisie in China as being the same as in the capitalist countries, and consequently to neglect the policy of forming a united front with the bourgeoisie and maintaining it for as long as possible. On the other hand, it is also necessary to combat the error of identifying the program, policy, ideology, practice, etc., of the proletariat with those of the bourgeoisie and neglecting the differences in principle between them. The error here consists in neglecting the fact that the bourgeoisie 
and especially the big bourgeoisie, not only exerts an influence on the petty bourgeoisie and the peasantry, but does its utmost to influence the proletariat and the Communist Party in a strenuous effort to destroy their ideological, political, and organizational independence, turn them into an appendage of the bourgeoisie and its political party, and ensure that it will reap the fruits of the revolution for itself or its political party alone. This error also consists in neglecting the fact that the bourgeoisie, and especially the big bourgeoisie, betrays the revolution whenever the revolution conflicts with its own selfish interests or with those of its own political party. To neglect all this is right opportunism. The characteristic feature of Chen Tu Xiu's right opportunism was that it led the proletariat to accommodate itself to the selfish interests of the bourgeoisie and its political party, and this was the subjective cause of the failure of the first great revolution. The dual character of the Chinese bourgeoisie in the bourgeois democratic revolution exerts a great effect on our political line and our party building, and without grasping this dual character we cannot have a good grasp of our political line or of party building. One important component of the political line of the Chinese Communist Party is the policy both of unity with the bourgeoisie and of struggle against it. In fact, the development and tempering of the party through its unity and struggle with the bourgeoisie are an important component of party building. Unity here means the united front with the bourgeoisie. Struggle here means the peaceful and bloodless struggle, ideological, political, and organizational, which goes on when we are united with the bourgeoisie and which turns into armed struggle when we are forced to break with it. If our party does not understand that it must unite with the bourgeoisie in certain periods, it cannot advance and the revolution cannot develop. If our party does not understand that it must wage a stern and resolute, peaceful struggle against the bourgeoisie while uniting with it, then our party will disintegrate ideologically, politically, and organizationally, and the revolution will fail. And if our party does not wage a stern and resolute armed struggle against the bourgeoisie when forced to break with it, our party will likewise disintegrate and the revolution will likewise fail. The truth of all this has been confirmed by the events of the past 18 years. Armed struggle by the Chinese Communist Party takes the form of peasant war under proletarian leadership. The history of this armed struggle, too, falls into three stages— the first was the stage in which we took part in the Northern Expedition. Our party had already begun to realize the importance of armed struggle, but did not understand it fully. It did not understand that armed struggle was the principal form of struggle in the Chinese Revolution. The second stage was the War of the Agrarian Revolution. By that time, our party had already built up its own independent armed forces, learned the art of fighting independently, and established people's political power and base areas. Our party was already able to achieve direct or indirect coordination of armed struggle, the principal form of struggle, with many other necessary forms, that is, to coordinate it on a national scale with the workers' struggle, the peasant struggle, which was the main thing, the struggle of the youth, the women, and all other sections of the people, the struggle for political power, the struggles on the economic, the anti-espionage, and the ideological fronts, and other forms of struggle and this armed struggle was the peasant agrarian revolution under the leadership of the proletariat. The third stage is the present stage, the war of resistance. In this stage, we are able to turn to good account our experience of armed struggle in the first and especially the second stage, and our experience of coordinating armed struggle with all other necessary forms of struggle. In general, armed struggle at the present time means guerrilla warfare. Footnote 2 In saying that in general, armed struggle in the Chinese Revolution means guerrilla warfare, Comrade Mao Zedong is summing up China's experience of revolutionary war, from the Second Revolutionary Civil War to the early days of the War of Resistance against Japan. During the long period of the Second Revolutionary Civil War, all the armed struggles led by the Chinese Communist Party took the form of guerrilla warfare. In the latter phase of that period, as the strength of the Red Army grew, guerrilla warfare changed into mobile warfare of a guerrilla character which, as Mao Zedong defines it, is guerrilla warfare on a higher level. But in the war of resistance against Japan with a different enemy and in different circumstances, there was a shift back to guerrilla warfare. 
In the early days of the anti-Japanese war, those party comrades who committed the error of right opportunism belittled the guerrilla warfare led by the party and depend their hopes on the operations of the Kuomintang army. Comrade Mao Zedong refuted their views in his Problems of Strategy in Guerrilla War Against Japan on Protracted War and Problems of War and Strategy, and in the present article he gave a theoretical summing up of the experience gained in waging the prolonged armed struggle of the Chinese Revolution, which took the form of guerrilla warfare. In the latter stage of the anti-Japanese war, and more particularly in the period of the Third Revolutionary Civil War, 1945 to 1949, guerrilla warfare changed into regular warfare as the main form of armed struggle under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, and this was due to the further growth of the revolutionary forces and the changes in the enemy's circumstances. The latter stage of the Third Revolutionary Civil War witnessed a further development when operations were conducted by huge formations which, equipped with heavy arms, were able to storm strongly fortified enemy positions. End of footnote 2 What is guerrilla warfare? It is the indispensable and therefore the best form of struggle for the people's armed forces to employ over a long period in a backward country, a large semi-colonial country, in order to inflict defeats on the armed enemy and build up their own bases. So far, both our political line and our party building have been closely linked with this form of struggle. It is impossible to have a good understanding of our political line and consequently of our party building in isolation from armed struggle, from guerrilla warfare. Armed struggle is an important component of our political line. For 18 years, our party has gradually learned to wage armed struggle and has persisted in it. We have learned that without armed struggle, neither the proletariat nor the people nor the Communist Party would have any standing at all in China and that it would be impossible for the revolution to triumph. In these years, the development, consolidation, and bolshevization of our party have proceeded in the midst of revolutionary wars. Without armed struggle, the Communist Party would assuredly not be what it is today. Comrades throughout the party must never forget this experience for which we have paid in blood. Similarly, there have been three distinct stages in the building up of the party, its development, consolidation, and bolshevization. The first stage was the party's infancy. In the early and middle phases of this stage, the party's line was correct, and the revolutionary zeal both of the rank and file and of the cadres was exceedingly high, hence the victories in the first great revolution. But after all, ours was then still an infant party. It lacked experience concerning the three basic problems of the United Front, armed struggle and party building. It did not have much knowledge of Chinese history and Chinese society, or of the specific features and laws of the Chinese Revolution, and it lacked a comprehensive understanding of the unity between the theory of Marxism-Leninism and the practice of the Chinese Revolution. Hence, in the last phase of this stage, or at the critical juncture of this stage, those occupying a dominant position in the party's leading body failed to lead the party in consolidating the victories of the revolution, and as a result, they were deceived by the bourgeoisie and brought the revolution to defeat. The party organizations expanded in this stage, but they were not consolidated, and they failed to help party members and cadres become firm and stable ideologically and politically. There were plenty of new members, but they were not given the necessary Marxist-Leninist education. There was also abundant experience in work, but it was not summed up properly. Many careerists sneaked into the party, but they were not combed out. The party was caught in a maze of schemes and intrigues, both of enemies and of allies, but it lacked vigilance. Within the party, activists came forward in great numbers, but they were not turned into the mainstay of the party in good time. The party had some revolutionary armed units under its command, but it was unable to keep a tight grip on them. The reasons for all this were inexperience, insufficient depth of revolutionary understanding, and ineptitude in integrating the theory of Marxism-Leninism with the practice of the Chinese Revolution. Such was the first stage of party building. The second stage was the War of the Agrarian Revolution. Our party was able to wage a successful agrarian revolutionary struggle for ten years because of the experience it had gained in the first stage because of its better understanding of the Chinese history and society 
and of these specific features and laws of the Chinese Revolution, and because its cadres had a better grasp of the theory of Marxism-Leninism and were better able to integrate it with the practice of the Chinese Revolution. Although the bourgeoisie had turned a traitor, our party was able to rely firmly on the peasantry. The party organization not only grew afresh, but also became consolidated day in, day out. The enemy tried to sabotage our party, but the party drove out the saboteurs. Once again, large numbers of cadres came forward in the party, and this time they became its mainstay. The party blazed the trail of people's political power, and thus learned the art of government. The party created strong armed forces and thus learned the art of war. These were momentous advances and achievements. Nevertheless, in the course of these great struggles, some of our comrades sank into the quagmire of opportunism, or did so at least for a time, and again the reasons were that they did not learn modestly from the experience of the past, did not acquire an understanding of Chinese history and society, and of these specific features and laws of the Chinese Revolution, and did not have an understanding of the unity between the theory of Marxism-Leninism and the practice of the Chinese Revolution. Hence, throughout this stage, certain people who held leading positions in the party failed to adhere to correct political and organizational lines. At one time, the party and the revolution were damaged by comrade Li Li San's left opportunism, at another by left opportunism in the Revolutionary War and in the work in the white areas. Not until the Tsun Yi meeting, the meeting of the political bureau at Tsun Yi Kui Chao in January 1935, did the party definitively take the road of Bolshevization and lay the foundations for its subsequent victory over Chong Kuo Tao's right opportunism and for the establishment of an anti-Japanese national united front. This was the second stage in the party's development. The third stage is that of the anti-Japanese National United Front. We have been in this stage for three years now, and these years of struggle are extremely important, drawing on its experience in the two preceding revolutionary stages, on its organizational strength, and the strength of its armed forces, on its high political prestige among the people of the whole country, and on its deeper understanding of the unity between the theory of Marxism-Leninism and the practice of the Chinese Revolution, our party has not only established the anti-Japanese National United Front, but also has been conducting the Great War of Resistance against Japan. Organizationally, it has stepped out of its narrow confines and become a major national party. Its armed forces are again growing and are becoming still stronger in the struggle against the Japanese aggressors. Its influence among the whole people is becoming more extensive. These are all great achievements. However, many of our new party members have not yet been given education. Many of the new organizations have not yet been consolidated. And there is still a vast difference between them and the older members and organizations. Many of the new party members and cadres have not yet had sufficient revolutionary experience. They still know little or nothing about Chinese history and society, or about these specific features and laws of the Chinese Revolution. Their understanding of the unity between the theory of Marxism-Leninism and the practice of the Chinese Revolution is far from being comprehensive. During the expansion of the party's organizations, a good many careerists and enemy saboteurs did succeed in sneaking in despite the fact that the Central Committee stressed the slogan, Expand the party boldly, but do not let a single undesirable in. Although the United Front was formed and has been maintained for three years now, the bourgeoisie, and especially the big bourgeoisie, has constantly been trying to destroy our party. The big bourgeoisie capitulators and diehards have been instigating serious friction throughout the country, and the anti-communist clamor is incessant. All this is being used by the big bourgeois capitulators and diehards to prepare the way for capitulating to Japanese imperialism, breaking up the United Front, and dragging China backwards. Ideologically, the big bourgeoisie is trying to corrode communism, whilst politically and organizationally, it is trying to liquidate the Communist Party, the border region, and the party's armed forces. In these circumstances, it is undoubtedly our task 
to overcome the dangers of capitulation, a split and retrogression, to maintain the National United Front and Kuomintang Communist cooperation as far as possible, to work for continued resistance to Japan and continued unity and progress, and at the same time, to prepare against all possible eventualities so that in case they occur, the party and the revolution will not suffer unexpected losses. To this end, we must strengthen the party's organization and its armed forces and mobilize the whole people for resolute struggle against capitulation, a split, and retrogression. The accomplishment of this task depends upon the efforts of the whole party, upon the unrelenting and persistent struggle of all party members, cadres, and organizations everywhere, and at every level. We are confident that the Chinese Communist Party, with its 18 years of experience, will be able to achieve these objectives by the joint efforts of its experienced older members and cadres, and its vigorous and youthful newer members and cadres, by the joint efforts of its well-tried Bolshevized Central Committee and its local organizations, and by the joint efforts of its powerful armed forces and the progressive masses. We have set out the principal experiences and principal problems of our party in its 18 years of history. Our 18 years of experience show that the United Front and armed struggle are the two basic weapons for defeating the enemy. The United Front is a united front for carrying on armed struggle, and the party is the heroic warrior wielding the two weapons, the United Front and the armed struggle, to storm and shatter the enemy's positions. That is how the three are related to each other. How are we to build up our party today? How can we build up a Bolshevized Chinese Communist Party, a party which is national in scale and has a broad mass character, a party which is fully consolidated ideologically, politically, and organizationally? The answer can be found by studying the party's history, by studying party building in connection with the United Front and armed struggle, in connection with the problem of both uniting and and struggling with the bourgeoisie and with that of persistence in guerrilla warfare against Japan by the 8th route and the new 4th armies and the establishment of anti-Japanese base areas. To sum up our 18 years of experience and our current new experience on the basis of our understanding of the unity between the theory of Marxism-Leninism and the practice of the Chinese Revolution and to spread this experience throughout the party, so that our party becomes as solid as steel and avoids repeating past mistakes. Such is our task. End of Introducing the Communist Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, Audiobook, Part 21 the Current Situation in the Party's Tasks October 10th, 1939 This was a decision drafted by Comrade Mao Zedong for the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. 1. The outbreak of the Imperialist World War is the result of the attempt of the imperialist countries to extricate themselves from a new economic and political crisis. Whether on the German side or the Anglo-French, the war is unjust, predatory, and imperialist in character. The communist parties throughout the world must firmly oppose this war and also the criminal action of the social democratic parties in betraying the proletariat by supporting it. The socialist Soviet Union is persevering, as before, in its policy of peace, is maintaining strict neutrality towards both belligerents and, by sending its armed forces into Poland, has checked the eastward expansion of the German forces of aggression, strengthened peace in Eastern Europe, and liberated its brother nations in Western Ukraine and Belarusia from the oppression of the Polish rulers. The Soviet Union has concluded a number of pacts with neighboring countries to prevent any possible attacks by the forces of international reaction and is endeavoring to restore world peace. 2. The policy of Japanese imperialism in this new international situation 
is to concentrate its attacks on China in order to settle the China question in preparation for extending its international adventures in the future. The policy by which it is attempting to settle the China question is as follows. A. With regard to the occupied areas, its policy is to tighten its hold on them in preparation for subjugating the whole of China. To do this, it has to mop up the anti-Japanese guerrilla base areas, exploit economic resources, set up puppet regimes, and break the people's national spirit. B. With regard to China's rear areas, its policy is to launch mainly political offensives, supplemented by military offensives. Political offensives mean concentration not on launching large-scale military attacks, but on disrupting the anti-Japanese United Front, breaking up Kuomintang communist cooperation, and inducing the Kuomintang government to capitulate. In the present period, the enemy is not likely to launch big strategic offensives like the one against Wuhan because of the blows dealt by China's heroic resistance during the past two years and of the inadequacy of his armed strength and financial resources. In this sense, basically, the war of resistance has reached the stage of strategic stalemate, and the stage of strategic stalemate is the stage of preparation for our counter-offensive. But first, when we say that basically a snailmate has been reached, we do not rule out the possibility of further offensive campaigns by the enemy. Changsha is now being attacked, and other places may be attacked later. Second, as the possibility of a stalemate at the front grows, the enemy will intensify his mopping up operations against our guerrilla base areas. Third, if China should fail to disrupt the enemy's occupation, of the areas he has seized and allow him to succeed in his attempts to tighten his hold on them and exploit them if China should fail to repulse the enemy's political offensives and to persist in resistance, unity, and progress and thus fail to accumulate strength for the counteroffensive, or if the Kuomintang government should capitulate of its own accord, then the enemy may still launch bigger offensives, in other words, the stalemate that has now been reached may still be broken by the enemy, or by the capitulators. 3. The danger of capitulation, a split and retrogression within the anti-Japanese united front, is still the greatest current danger, and the present anti-communist and retrogressive actions of the big landlords and the big bourgeoisie continue to be preparatory steps to their capitulation. In order to build up strength for the counter-offensive, it is still our task, in cooperation with all Chinese patriots, to mobilize the masses for the effective application of the three great political slogans put forward in our party's manifesto of July 7th. Persist in resistance and oppose capitulation. Persist in unity and oppose a split. And persist in progress and oppose retrogression. To achieve this objective behind the enemy lines, it is imperative to keep up guerrilla warfare. Defeat the enemy's mopping up operations, disrupt the enemy's occupation of the areas he has seized, and introduce radical political and economic changes beneficial to the masses who are resisting Japan. At the front, it is imperative to sustain military defense and repel any offensive campaigns the enemy may launch. In China's rear area, it is imperative to introduce speedy and genuine political reforms end the Kuomintang's one-party dictatorship, convene a national assembly truly representative of the people's will, and invested with real power, draw up and adopt a constitution, and put constitutional government into practice. Any vacillation or procrastination, any contrary policy, is absolutely wrong. At the same time, the leading bodies of our party at all levels and all party members must exercise more vigilance in the present situation and do their utmost to achieve the ideological, political, and organizational consolidation of our party and of the armed forces and organs of political power under its leadership in order to be ready for any emergency endangering the Chinese revolution and to prevent unexpected losses to the party and the revolution. End of the current situation and the party's tasks. Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, 
Audiobook Part 22 Recruit Large Numbers of Intellectuals December 1st, 1939 This was a decision drafted by Comrade Mao Zedong for the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Footnote 1 The term intellectuals refers to all those who have had middle school or higher education and those with similar educational levels. They include university and middle school teachers and staff members, university and middle school students, primary school teachers, professionals, engineers, and technicians, among whom the university and middle school students occupy an important position. End of footnote 1 1. In the long and ruthless war of national liberation and the great struggle to build a new China, the Communist Party must be good at winning intellectuals, for only in this way will it be able to organize great strength for the war of resistance, organize the millions of peasants, develop the revolutionary cultural movement, and expand the revolutionary united front. Without the participation of the intellectuals, victory in the revolution is impossible. 2. Our party and our army have made considerable efforts to recruit intellectuals during the last three years, and many revolutionary intellectuals have been absorbed into the party, the army, the organs of government, the cultural movement, and the mass movement, thus broadening the united front. This is a major achievement. But many of the army cadres are not yet alive to the importance of the intellectuals. They still regard them with some apprehension and are even inclined to discriminate against them or shut them out. Many of our training institutes are still hesitant about enrolling young students in large numbers. Many of our local party branches are still reluctant to let intellectuals join. All this is due to failure to understand the importance of the intellectuals for the revolutionary cause. The difference between intellectuals in colonial and semi-colonial countries and those in capitalist countries and the difference between intellectuals who serve the landlords and the bourgeoisie and those who serve the working class and the peasantry as well as the seriousness of the situation in which the bourgeois political parties are desperately contending with us for the intellectuals and in which the Japanese imperialists are also trying, in every possible way, to buy over Chinese intellectuals or corrupt their minds. In particular, it is due to the failure to understand the favorable factor that our party and our army have already developed a hard core of well-tested cadres and are thus capable of leading the intellectuals. 3. From now on, attention should therefore be paid to the following. A. All party organizations in the war areas and all army units led by the party should recruit large numbers of intellectuals into our army, training institutes, and organs of government. We should use various ways and means to recruit all intellectuals who are willing to fight Japan and who are fairly loyal, hardworking, and are able to endure hardship we should give them political education and help them to temper themselves in war and work and to serve the army, the government, and the masses, and, taking each case on its merits, we should admit into the party those who measure up to the requirements of party membership. As for those who do not qualify or do not wish to join the party, we should have good working relations with them and give them guidance in their work with us. B. In applying the policy of recruiting intellectuals in large numbers, we must undoubtedly take great care to prevent the infiltration of those elements sent in by the enemy and the bourgeois political parties and to keep out other disloyal elements. We must be very strict about keeping out such elements. Those who have already sneaked into our party, army, or government organs must be firmly but discriminatingly combed out on the basis of conclusive evidence. But... We must not on that account suspect reasonably loyal intellectuals, and we must be strictly on guard against the false accusation of innocent people by counter-revolutionaries. C. We should assign appropriate work to all intellectuals who are reasonably loyal and useful, and we should earnestly give them political education and guidance, so that in the long course of the struggle they gradually overcome their weaknesses, revolutionize their outlook, identify themselves with the masses, and merge with the older party members and cadres and the worker and peasant members of the party. D. The necessity of admitting intellectuals into our work should be brought home to those cadres, and especially to certain cadres in the main forces of our army, who are opposed to their admission. At the same time, we should work effectively to encourage worker and peasant cadres to study hard and raise their cultural level. 
Thus, worker and peasant cadres will at the same time become intellectuals, while the intellectuals will, at the same time, become workers and peasants. E. In the main, the principles stated above are also applicable in the Kumintang areas and in the Japanese-occupied areas, except that on admitting intellectuals into the party, more attention must be paid to their degree of loyalty so as to ensure still tighter party organization in those areas. We should maintain suitable contact with the huge numbers of non-party intellectuals who sympathize with us and organize them in the great struggle for resistance to Japan and for democracy and in the cultural movement and the work of the United Front. 4. All our party comrades must understand that a correct policy towards the intellectuals is an important prerequisite for a victory in the revolution. There must be no repetition of the incorrect attitude towards intellectuals which party organizations in many localities and army units adopted during the agrarian revolution. The proletariat cannot produce intellectuals of its own without the help of the existing intellectuals. The Central Committee hopes that the party committees at all levels and all party comrades will give this matter their serious attention. End of Recruit Large Numbers of Intellectuals